Okay, so in this video what we're going to do is discuss in vivo gene cloning, uh, which is basically using bacteria uh, to copy DNA that we want to uh, have copied, basically. So cloning just means, when you say gene cloning, cloning means copying something. Gene cloning means copying a gene. In vivo means in life, so we're basically using bacteria to copy genes, is what that title means. Okay, so um, basically the way in which this is achieved is you take the piece of DNA that you want to copy and you insert it into the bacterial genome. You insert it into a specific part of the bacterial genome called the plasmid and then the bacteria copies the plasmid for you and then basically you extract the plasmid back out and then get your gene out of the plasmid again. Okay, so... Um, Let's start off with the piece of DNA that we want to copy. So, uh, it, let's say it is a poor, it's within a larger piece of DNA now. So, it, this is where it's unlike polymerase chain reaction, because in the polymerase chain reaction, you start off, uh, you know, with a, a fragment of DNA that you want to copy. In um, in vivo gene cloning, the way we're going to get the gene into, um, into the bacterial plasmid means that the actual position of the gene within the DNA, within the larger piece of DNA is actually relevant, and if you don't understand what I've just said, don't worry, I'm going to go for it. Alright, so let's say we have some gene here that we want to copy. We would like to produce lots and lots of copies of this piece of DNA here. Basically, what you need to use is enzymes to cut the DNA uh, up here, and you need to cut the DNA up here so that you can then insert it into the bacterial genome. So let me just discuss the bacterial genome. Let's say we have a bacterium here. Now, bacteria do not have nuclei. They are prokaryotic organisms. So the DNA is within the cytoplasm. Now, they have one huge piece of DNA, which is over here. But they have a small, smaller pieces of DNA, which they can have lots of. So this is the main bacterial genome. But they also have little rings of DNA called plasmids within them. Okay, and basically, we are not going to uh, insert our uh, our gene into the actual bacterial genome, and I don't know why I've only drawn half of it. We're not going to insert our DNA into this actual bacterial genome over here. This is the main bacterial genome. Uh, we are going to insert it into a plasmid, and the reason is that bacteria copy plasmids just continuously. So let's say this bacterium has this plasmid here, which I'll colour in green. So this is our little green plasmid. Basically, the bacterium just sitting happily here will just copy this plasmid away and away and away. And the reason is that it often that it will donate some of these plasmids to its uh, to its neighbours, basically. And this is an important part of. Um, of uh, bacterial life. So that's why these plasmids are very attractive to us as uh, molecular biologists, because if we put our gene into one of those plasmids, then the bacteria will just copy this plasmid away and away and away and fill itself up with this plasmid, which will be filled with our gene. Whereas the bacterial genome, this main piece of DNA, is only going to be copied when the bacterium divides, so it's going to uh, be copied much less. That's why the plasmids are a very uh, attractive, um, attractive option for sticking our gene in there. Right, so let's draw the plasmid out bigger here. So this is our plasmid here. If we want to put in our gene into this plasmid, then what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to cut the plasmid somewhere, so it's a circular piece of DNA. We're going to have to cut it somewhere, and uh, then we're going to have to stick in our gene, basically. Okay, so there is a very, very clever way of cutting DNA, which is that we use uh, nature, basically. We, we don't have a way of cutting DNA at an exact point, but nature has already done it for us, basically. So, um, in bacteria, there are bacteria make enzymes basically which cut DNA, and the reason they make uh, enzymes which cut DNA is because bacteria are hugely vulnerable to attack themselves by viruses. And when viruses enter bacteria, what they do is they inject in their DNA. So I'll draw this. So here's a bacterium, and here's a bacteriophage, which is a type of virus which infects bacterium, and they're the ones that look like creepy space sort of shuttle things. A war of the worlds kind of things. Anyway, they sort of latch on and they inject 
inject their DNA into the bacterium. And then what happens is that uh, the bacterium, uh, well, what the virus wants to happen is it wants the bacterium to then, uh, then transcribe and translate the proteins encoded for by the viral genome. However, bacteria have evolved uh, ways of dealing with this. And basically, they have enzymes, which are called restriction enzymes. So this is a restriction enzyme. And basically, restriction enzymes uh, they're called restriction enzymes because they restrict the entry of viral DNA. And the way in which they restrict the entry of viral DNA is that when the viral DNA comes in, they basically chop it up and make it useless. Okay, and the way in which they do this and avoid cutting up their own DNA, because, you know, bacteria have their own DNA, so why don't the restriction enzymes end up cutting all the bacterial DNA as well as the viral DNA? The reason is that bacterial DNA uh, restriction enzymes specifically target sequences of organic bases. So this restriction enzyme will basically recognize a certain uh, sequence of bases. So I'll give you an example, basically. So um, let's say we have this sequence of bases, GAATTC, and then on the other side you'll have T uh, CTT. Um, AAG. And you'll notice something very nice about that pattern. But basically, um, if you have that sequence in your DNA, that is a sequence that isn't usually expressed in bacterial DNA. You don't usually have this combination of organic bases next to each other. So, But it is in viral DNA. So if we make an enzyme that cuts when it recognizes this sequence and it cuts it at this sequence, uh, then it will just cut up viral DNA and not bacterial DNA. And there is, in fact, a restriction enzyme uh, which uh, does this. This is the EcoR1 restriction enzyme. And the reason it's called that is because it was found in E. coli, basically. So E. coli restriction enzyme 1, basically. And basically what it does is it recognizes this sequence of DNA and then produces a cut at that sequence of DNA. However, it does not just cut the DNA in an easy to understand fashion. It doesn't just sort of cut it down like that. Instead, what it does is it cuts it in a staggered way, so it cuts it like this, basically. So it chops uh, the phosphodiesterase bond on one side here, and on the other side, basically, over here, between the G and the A's, basically. Okay, so it creates these overlaps, basically, which are known as sticky ends. And the reason this is very, very nice for us doing molecular biology is if it cut it just like this, if it made a double-strand break uh, where it was just like uh, where you didn't have these overhangs, basically, which is called a blunt end, um, then uh, there's no specificity for how you rejoin these. And let me explain what I mean by that in a bit more detail. So if we can find this sequence in our DNA up here, for instance, so if we can find uh, one of these combinations up here, so I'll draw it out. Let's say we can find GAATTC up here, and then uh, CTTAAG on this side. Uh, and we can also find one on this side of our gene as well. So we find a GAA, uh, TTC, and a CTT, AAG site over here. Then we can use this restriction enzyme, basically, to come down here and cut our gene out, can't we? So we can cut it out very effectively because it will come over here and it will cut like that. Now, if we can also find um, also find this sequence somewhere in the plasmid, and th that seems contradictory because I've said, you know, that this, this enzyme cuts up viral DNA and doesn't cut up bacterial DNA, and the reason it didn't cut up bacterial DNA was because this sequence wasn't in the bacterial DNA. However, um, basically, this enzyme is found naturally in E. coli, um, but yeah, that, and that means that E. coli will not have this sequence anywhere in its DNA. However, it doesn't mean that other bacteria won't have this sequence somewhere within their DNA. Okay, so let's say we've got this plasmid, and it does indeed have one of these combinations somewhere. So it does have a GAATTC region, uh, with a CTTAAG being the complementary thing. And basically, it'll come along and break that up. Now, what's beautiful about this is that we can now just slot uh, this entire piece of DNA into there, because this overhang here is perfectly complementary to the overhang that you have here. And this overhang up here, the superior overhang here, is perfectly complementary to the overhang that we have over here. Now, why is that nicer than having blunt ends? Well, it means that you get a very high specificity 
you cannot just put any old piece of DNA into this once you've cut it open. You have to have the correct overhangs. So if you have blunt ends, you know, you could stick any old fragment of DNA in there. It wouldn't need to be cut in this uh, by this enzyme specifically with this specific overhang. So by using uh, a restriction enzyme with this uh, sticky ends property, you get specificity and you can ensure that the piece of DNA that actually gets inserted into your plasmid is the piece of DNA that you've cut out from your original DNA that you wanted to copy. Okay, uh, right. Now, I want to discuss something very nice about this sequence here. Uh, if you look at this, G-A-A-T-T-C, it is what is known as base pair palindromic. And this is a, uh, a property that you see with a huge amount of restriction enzymes, that uh, they cut at uh, recognition sequence. That's what this is called, a recognition sequence for the restriction enzyme ECO-R1. They cut at recognition sequences which have a base pair palindromic sequence. And what I mean by that is, well, what's usually meant by palindrome? A palindrome is something like Hannah, uh, where if you read it backwards, it reads the same as you read, uh, oh sorry, if you read it backwards, it reads the same as it, if you read it forwards. So uh, if you read it this way, H-A-N-N-A-H. If you read it backwards, H-A-N-N-A-H. So it's exactly the same reading it backwards as it is reading forwards. Now, base pair palindromic is slightly more complicated than a palindrome. So that's a palindrome in normal English. Base pair palindromic means that if you read it backwards, you have the complementary uh, organic base at the opposite position. So let me show you. Uh, so if we bring this sequence out, it's G-A-A-T-T-C. So if you read it forwards, you get G-A-A-T-T-C. If you read it backwards, you get C-T-T-A-A-G. Now that is not a palindrome, obviously, but it is a base pair palindrome because if you read it backwards, you start off with C. Now C is the complementary uh, base pair to G. Then you have T. T is the complementary base pair to A. Then you have T again, which is the complementary base pair to A. Then you have A, which is the complementary base pair to T. So basically, if you read it backwards, the uh, organic bases that you have in each position is are the ones that were complementary to if you read it forwards, basically. That's what is meant by base pair palindromic. Now why? Why? Do these bacteria just have some sort of appreciation for that? Um, no. The reason that you have it, it base pair palindromic is because if the enzyme comes from this side, it looks exactly the same as if it comes from the other side, basically. It's so that it can cut this recognition site if it comes at the DNA from either side. Because basically, the DNA that you have on this side, this piece of DNA here, is exactly the same as the piece of DNA here. Because remember the way that the DNA is structured. The two strands are anti-parallel. Let me, uh, let me remind, remind you of that. So... Um, if we just have a bit of a reminder of the structure of DNA, you have your sugar phosphate backbone here. And on one side, so if we start off here, let's have this side here. On one side, the sugar phosphate backbone po points upwards. On the other side, the sugar phosphate backbone points downwards. So if we draw this one here, and this is the G here. So basically, um, these, this piece of DNA here ends up being exactly the same as this piece of DNA here. And let me, let, I think I need to draw the whole thing out to actually make you, uh, make sure you understand this. So if I uh, draw the entire thing out, then you end up with something like this. So the next one is T along here. So I'm going down here. And um, I'll just sort of, to, avoid, to keep up time, I'll just draw that arrow to denote that the phosphate, the five prime carbon is going that way on this strand. So then we have the organic base T, um, and then we have um, A, A, G here. Now on the other way, the organic, the um, f uh, the sugar phosphate backbone is going this way. The five prime carbon is pointing this way, and this way you have um, what do you have? You have A here, A again, then T, T. Uh, C. And basically, if you look at this piece of DNA, it's exactly the same as this piece of DNA here, because if we cut this out here and cut it out down here, then we could rotate it round and it would be exactly the same piece of DNA, basically. And that's because of the uh, way in which the, um, the, str 
two strands of DNA run anti-parallel to one another, i.e. one runs this way, the other runs the other way. So basically, the advantage of having base pair palindromic sequences is that if the DNA, if the restriction enzyme comes this way, it sees the exact same thing as if it approaches from this direction, basically. So it means that it can act approaching from either side of the DNA. It doesn't need to approach it from a certain direction. Okay, so that's why base pair palindromic recognition sequences are useful. Okay, right. So that's a whirlwind tour of restriction endonucleases. Uh, so uh, restriction enzymes, I should say, their full name is restriction endonucleases. So restriction endonucleases. So the reason they're called that is anything that ends with an ase is an enzyme. Endonuclease, so it's an enzyme, ase. Uh, but endonuclease means that it cuts DNA um, midway. So let me just explain what I mean by that. So if we have a fragment of DNA here, and it, uh, and basically that's the DNA ended. It starts here and it ends here. So there's nothing beyond here and there's nothing beyond here. Right. An ectonuclease is something that chops a nucleotide off from the end. Okay. So it cuts a bond, but it cuts it right at the end. So that's an ectonuclease. So it's breaking apart nucleotides at the end, which is why the ecto is there. An endonuclease is something that breaks nucleotides apart mid-strand. So it would come in right in the middle here. It doesn't need to have an end, basically. It doesn't cut the nucleotide off from the end. It can just come into the middle of a DNA strand and cut uh, two nucleotides apart. And that's what an endonuclease is. Right, so that's why these are restriction endonucleases, because they just come in here, they cut nucleotides apart on both sides, and that's how they cut this gene out. So in the next video, what we'll do is continue our discussion of in vivo gene cloning.